Fun times in Cleveland again. Still Cleveland. Come on down to Cleveland Town, everyone. Under construction since 1868. See our river that catches on fire. It's so polluted that all our fish have... 1969, another fire. And the Cuyahoga, a relative unknown, became an overnight sensation. The pollution problem received national attention. Time magazine reported shortly after the incident, some river, chocolate brown, oily, bubbling with subsurface gases, it oozes rather than flows. Anyone who falls into the Cuyahoga does not drown, Cleveland citizens joke grimly, he decays. All joking aside, the situation was indeed grim. Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality, clean air and clean water, the wise use of our land, the protection of wildlife and natural beauty, parks for all to enjoy. These are part of the birthright of every American. To guarantee that birthright, we must act and act decisively. It is literally now or never. It's 1969, and on a nice June Sunday morning, you wake up in your nice single-family home to the sight of dark black plumes in the sky and a horrible industrial-like smell. Oh, it appears that Cuyahoga is on fire. Neat. The Cuyahoga fire was one of the watershed, pun intended, moments that turned the American public towards environmental considerations. This was summarized in the following year, with then-President Nixon passing the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA for short, into law, which then established the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and Environmental Review in Federal Projects. Not to be outdone by his future predecessor within the confines of Republican presidencies, Ronald Reagan, then Governor of California, passed the California Environmental Quality Act into state law. Thus, CEQA was born. This was totally the correct and accurate reasoning into why he passed CEQA. Okay, so it, that's not the reason why California passed CEQA. The real reason arguably deals with federalism. To put it briefly, when the federal government passes a law that regulates action, states will usually pass a law that equals or surpasses the standards of the federal law. When this happens, instead of the federal government regulating the law directly, they can give the power of regulation to the states themselves. Therefore, many states have passed their own version of NEPA to maintain control of projects. It is important to know that no one knows which law was conceived first. While NEPA was passed first because of the similarities between CEQA and NEPA, it is possible NEPA might have actually been based off of a draft of CEQA. It is important to understand CEQA is much more substantive than NEPA, as not only does it require projects to disclose environmental impacts, but also to avoid or mitigate impacts when feasible to do so. It is also important to know that some projects fall under only CEQA, while others fall under NEPA and CEQA. For example, if you wanted to establish a nuclear power plant within the state of California, you would need to perform an Stop EIR right from there, CEQA and an EIS per NEPA, as both the CPUC and NBC would be lead agencies in the project. Since CEQA in considerations is more stringent than NEPA, if you're meeting CEQA requirements, you're already meeting and sometimes exceeding the federal standards. However, because of the interagency workings, of having two lead agencies, one for CEQA and another one for NEPA, things can be a bit tricky. Thus, there are guidelines specifically dedicated to scenarios like that one, which we can find on the OPR and EPA websites. Last episode, we touched on how CEQA is a living document. It evolves over time through changes in the statutes and interpretation. Well, one of these arguably major changes occurred way back in 1972. Let's set the scene. 1972, Las Vegas millionaire Mike Oliver's libertarian paradise of Minerva declares independence and shortly thereafter is dismantled by Tonga through annexation. The Germans beat the Soviet football, the F-15 makes its maiden flight, Nixon and Agnew are renominated at the RNC, oh, and something, 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 Watergate, I believe it was the subsequent meeting, CIA, FBI, something, something, but what's special? Okay, now it's September of the same year, and we find ourselves in the Supreme Court of California. Why are we here? They already solved the moral question of whether the death penalty was constitutional, what else is so important to the side? Well... 
Earlier in April, International Recreation, a development company, applied for a conditional use permit within Mono County on the site that was next to Mammoth Lakes. The CUP comprised of two condos, a restaurant, and specialty shops, whatever that means. Friends of Mammoth sued the county as they believed the permit to be invalid as an environmental review was required. Well, actually, they got a petition to invalidate the process, which was sent to the wrong court, so they had to do it twice. I'm kind of embarrassing, not gonna lie. And they appealed it all the way to the state Supreme Court. Remember, this is still the early years of CEQA. CEQA's original purpose was to disclose the environmental impact of government actions, which were considered projects. This big law had many different interpretations by different agencies. Some agencies covered government action as specifically government projects, while other agencies believed it applied to any project that had government funding. Things like prisons, schools, freeways were obviously covered under CEQA. However, as the court noted, nowhere in the act is project defined, which may have been or not on purpose. Well, that term was put to the test here, where Friends of Mammoth challenged the Mono County Board of Supervisors regarding the board's decision to approve ACUP on the basis that approving the project was a discretionary action, and therefore, subject to CEQA. Of course, the defendants, in this case, International and the Board of Supervisors, argued that CEQA only applied to public works projects, as that was how the statute was interpreted up until that point in time by the lead agency, which was the Board of Supervisors. Long story short, the court majority sided with Friends of Mammoth, noting that the incongruity of interpreting CEQA as solely for public projects would be most vivid in the less populous counties, such as Mono, which because of limited economic capabilities might never engage in massive public works projects, significantly affecting the environment, but could achieve the same result by permitting, licensing, or partially funding private activities. Basically, the court said if CEQA were to continue to be interpreted as fully government-funded projects, less economically gifted areas would be shafted ecologically by private interests as they would have free reign and no environmental oversight or review. And that was not the spirit of this law. The spirit of the law considered government action. This in itself is a broad range of things from direct construction to funding to, in this case, the action of permitting a private project. And this case is how now all discretionary projects, whether private or public, now fall under CEQA. You put the lime in the coconut and drink them both up. You put As a repeat of last time, courts usually abide by set guidelines and statutes, but will change the interpretation of them if need be. While statutes are implemented by legislative actions, such as from the Senate, Assembly, or initiatives, the ones that write the guidelines are the Natural Resource Board and the Governor's Office of Planning Research, better known as OPR. A project is defined by CEQA as any activity which has the potential for resulting in either a direct physical change in the environment or a reasonably foreseeable indirect physical change in the environment. In practical terms, to be a project in terms of CEQA, it must be both of the following, carried out, approved, or funded by the public agency, and whether it may cause a change in the physical environment. If it passes both tests, it is a project, and therefore, ding dong, is subject to environmental review under CEQA. Okay, so I talked about this briefly previously. In more detail, CEQA only applies to projects that require discretionary approvals. Discretionary means that a public agency exercises judgment in deciding whether to approve or disapprove a proposed project. Additionally, if an agency has authority to modify a proposed project or deny approval in response to environmental concerns, it's an action and it is discretionary. This is different from a ministerial project where a public agency approves or disapproves a proposed project based on whether the project meets certain standards set by statute, also known as law. If it's ministerial, it does not require a hearing or review by a commission or board. Most projects considered by CEQA are the typical development project. However, cases where more literal forms of action are taken are also common. In 2005, PGE decided to update the Diablo nuclear power plant by removing its old turbines and replacing it with updated ones. This required an EIR with the CPUC being the lead agency. For some reason, I'm not sure why, the project was not carried out even with the finished EIR. CEQA applies to all government agencies subject to the jurisdiction of California law at all levels, including state agencies, boards, commissions, counties, cities, regional agencies, and special districts. This state law does not apply to any non-governmental agency, like a tribal authority, nor a federal agency, the governor, or even the judiciary. However, NEPA, the federal version, applies to select discretionary federal projects. All eligible agencies must adopt CEQA implementation procedures that are consistent with the law. They should contain the following. Environmental regulation was never that big of a deal before these environmental laws. 
However, as science advances, we continue to further our understanding of how important the environment is within the context of many things such as human health and the services it provides to us. SQL's role in protecting the environment cannot be understated in this regard. It opens our eyes to the possible impacts and methods of mitigating it, whereas without it, we wouldn't think of any of these things. It's finally a public disclosure law, and I want to make that clear. I'm going to make that clear SQL for the rest of the whole time law. I'm SQL with you talking on this channel. It is a public law. disclosure law. law. Its main purpose is public transparency of discretionary decisions. Of course, its area of implementation has reached outward over the decades from strictly government projects to today's ever-changing definitions. However, its main purpose has stayed true throughout the decades, even in the face of judicial and legislative expansion. To the concerned public, SQL is one of many laws, looking at you, Brown Act, that holds larger political forces within the context of local government, a check from the abuse of power that comes along with it. To others, it is a way that allows the state to build more environmentally consciously and responsibly. Whatever the case may be, the law itself has changed character throughout its life and still changes to this day. Even so, its main mission of informing the public is its main objective and it remains so. Next episode, we'll talk about the sequel process from start to finish, so buckle up for that one. I'll catch you next time.